So my first question is, where did you get the idea to do the office hours project you've been doing these last few months? You know what? I, I, it's, <laughs> I'm glad that you noticed that because I'm not sure anybody else has. It's, it's, a, it's an idea I've had for a long time uh, w where I thought it would be interesting. I always wondered if there were people who I wanted to talk to like what if they had office hours, just like a professor had office hours, and I could just go in there and ask them a question, and I and it didn't exist, and I said, well, maybe I should do that, um, not and 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 hold office hours with some really interesting people, and, because I think there are a lot of folks out there in the world who want to talk to these folks, and I sure would want to talk to them, and so I just decided to do it, and the extraordinary thing about this world that we live in now is that, I mean, essentially for no cost, I was able to do. What's a set? What's amounts to a radio talk show that's available across the world? I mean, it's just incredible. And so I'm just doing it. I mean, and it's one of those things where, you know, I I sort of was following um, a lot of the guidance of people at IDEO or people like Seth Godin of saying, hey, just try something and see what happens. And so that's what I decided to do. And I think it had a huge success, right? Well, I mean, it's been it's been really interesting. We've gotten a really, really good response to it. And I just had a great time talking to some really, really interesting people. In fact, the day that you and I, Maria, are talking, uh, we did a show uh, just uh, literally a few hours ago uh, with uh, Susan Cain, who talking about introverts. And that was just really cool and interesting. So um, it's just one of those things, you know, just I get, try to roll it out, see what happens. Okay, so now I have a question for you from uh, David Orban, okay. who is the CEO of DotSub. Okay. So this is the question. Soon we will have superior automation taking over most of white-collar jobs, just as mm. most blue-collar jobs have been automated, or even when yeah. computers will start intruding into domains that today we believe are the exclusive realm of human creativity. Right. What are the best strategies to maintain a sense of purpose in the lives of billions who won't feel they can have any impact? How will yeah. the human yeah wait, 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 just right. a second? Uh, how will the human condition be impacted? The very definition of what it means to be human. Yeah, it's a really interesting question, and and I, I guess the the nerd in me wants to question the premise of the question. All right. Uh, I mean, that, there, there's a there's a there's a notion in in economics what's that's called the lump of labor fallacy you know like lump a lump of something right. the lump of labor fallacy which basically says that we sometimes we think that um, all the jobs that there are are right now and any time a job is lost through automation or moving to a low cost preserve that it's basically we have it's just like we have this finite number of jobs out there to do and if we lose any, then someone's going to suffer. And that's proven just flatly wrong. And so here in the United States, we have an, enorm we have an enormous manufacturing sector. The United States has a larger, right now, in terms of output, a larger manufacturing sector than China. Now, we do it with far fewer people than we ever did before because we got really, really good at it. That's called productivity. We got really good at it. So there are... Blue, quote unquote blue collar jobs in here in the United States. It's just that they're far fewer of them than there were 50 years ago. And those blue collar jobs are really different. It's not a bunch of 58 year old white men in blue shirts with grease on them turning the same screw the same way. It is a 28 year old woman with an associate well, here, a two year degree here in the States, an associate's degree programming things on a computer. And so uh, when work gets automated, uh, anytime work gets automated, in any era of history, people say, oh, no, there aren't going to be enough jobs for people. Right. Oh, no, it's all going to be, you know, it's, it's going to be chaos and despair. And it's never been true. And I think the same right. thing is true here. That, that there, we don't, that what's, 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 what's challenging is that we don't know what those new jobs are going to be. In the same right. way that, that when blue-collar work began being automated, 50 years ago, continuing to be automated even to this day, but when we had, a spe in this country, this move from a manufacturing economy to a services economy, which began in the 1950s, people would say, oh, a service economy, that's bogus, that's nothing, you know, what are you talking right. about? And, you know, they didn't imagine jobs for 
uh, in data analytics. They didn't imagine jobs for social media people. They didn't imagine jobs for search engine optimizers. And so I'm less despairing about that than, much less than David is. Not because I'm an optimist, but because, you know, we've seen this movie before. And the lump of labor fallacy typically remains a fallacy. What it does do, and what's uneasy for us, is that it creates uncertainty in the moment. And it requires a certain leap of faith to say, hey, it's going to be different tomorrow than it is going to be today. One last thing that he makes a point of, um, you know, there is this idea out there called the singularity, which suggests that, you know, as you know, that, that um, machine intelligence will surpass human intelligence. I'm skeptical of that. Um, but if that ends up being right, all bets are off. Right. Well, David is actually inside the Singularity University. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 that, so that makes sense. Now, the thing is, I'm, I'm skeptical. I mean, I, I can see it happening over a very long period, uh, over a very long period of time. And I can see a move, definitely a move toward more um, person machine interfaces. Right. Um, but I, I just don't. I'm somewhat skeptical that the, the Ray Kurzweil vision of things is going to occur, at least within our, our, our lifetimes, even if Kurzweil is right that our lifetimes are going to be really, really long. But if that's the case, that's a game changer. That's like, it, that changes everything if, if right. machines end up being smarter than people. Right. Well, we could talk for, for days about that, but I have another yeah, yeah. question um, from uh, Jason Konopinski who asks, how much do you think motivation is, is a need to keep up with those around you versus an internal drive to accomplish things? That's a great question, it's both. Um, I mean, human beings have a mix of, human beings have a mix of motives. Uh, we have, I mean, very complex set of motives. We do things for biological reasons. I mean, I, you know, uh, it's, when you, as you and I are talking, it is about, excuse me for scratching my eyelid, it is about 3.15 here in the United States. Well, three hours ago, I was motivated by the biological urge of hunger to go right. over and have lunch. Okay, so we have biological urges, and and we we also respond to rewards and punishments in our environment. That's a bi that's a big part of who we are. So if you say to me, um, uh, I'll give you a thousand dollars for extending this interview for another fifteen minutes, I'll probably I'll probably go another fifteen minutes. Okay, <laughs> you know? right. Uh, uh, you know, because re we're, we're responsive to that. And this idea of keeping up is one of those kinds of motivators. And human beings are absolutely concerned about status. We're concerned about how we rate relative to someone else. Um, that, I think, in some ways, that, that quest very rarely leads to any satisfaction because you can always, you're always, you're always going to find someone who is, um, higher status than you are, whatever your metric for status is, um, and so that. But but that is a part that is a motivator. But you know the other thing we have to recognize is that human beings also have this other motivator. We do. We also do things because they're interesting, because they're fulfilling, because they matter to us, because they contribute to a world. And, and so, I guess you know an argument in this book drive is that I think a lot of times, especially in our organizations, we stop at that second drive. And, and take only a two-dimensional view of human beings right. when it should be a three-dimensional view of human beings. All right, so I'm going to go to my last question, which is um, by Marc Rougier from um, Scoop It. And um, he says that he works with uh, students and uh, young frequent uh, would-be entrepreneurs, you know? So he tries to mo motivate them as much as he can. But mm -hmm. he has one question about it. Yeah. How can he use the energy, this know-how, the motivation to make the world better? Not in a philosophical sense, um, but trying to improve things not for ourselves, but also for other people. Hmm. Um, it's an interesting question. I'm not, I'm not sure I completely grasp what he's getting at, but, but it sounds to me that he's getting at this this concept, 
I, it, what, what he's describing in a way, as I hear it, is a, is a concept of service. That is, being of service it, it, um, is the goal in itself can be a motivator. And that is absolutely the case. Uh, there is a lot. There is a lot of evidence of that. That that is an extraordinarily that that can be an extraordinarily powerful motivator. And what's interesting, given the previous question, unlike status, it can actually lead to both depth and endurance of of well being. That when people actually serve others, help others, improve the lot of others, they actually do experience a rise in subjective well being. There's no question about that. Right. In a way that. People do when it's status. If I have, you know, it's like, oh, gosh, I have a, uh, I keep pointing over here because I'm in my, I work in my, there's a garage behind my house, right. which is my off, which is my office. And so, you know, like, like literally there's a driveway there. I mean, literally right there. And so, um, you know, it could be if I cared about the status of my, of my, my automobiles that, you know, my neighbor drives a Toyota and I come in in a BMW and I'm like, woohoo, I'm awesome. I have higher right. status. And I would have a rise in subjective well-being very briefly, and then it would be, oh my God, I've got to, you know, I've sort of metabolized having a BMW. I got to find something else. I got to go get a Rolls Royce or something. Whereas right. being a, being of service is more enduring, and I think that's what what he's describing, and it's a really powerful motivator. And there's a lot of interesting research out there that says that when we try to motivate others, a lot of times we appeal to people's self-interest in motivating. This is going to be good for you. And sometimes appeals to a broader interest can be even more, basically the service ethic can be even more persuasive. Yeah, he went uh, on actually and explained okay. the, the concept and was like, um, the people who are expert in motivation, he wrote, will do something great for you. They will help you find an inner force so you can be someone better. You can express yourself, you can dream and act, but this is all for yourself. Is there any way we can motivate people to find this extra force, but with a goal, with a sense, like a broader sense? That was the, the I think main so. question. I, I, yeah. I, yeah, and I think that I think what it is is explaining to people um, kind of the point of the exercise or why they're there. Let, let, let me make it a little bit more concrete by talking about a right. really interesting study that that gets at this. Fascinating study done by a guy named Adam Grant, who's at University of Pennsylvania, who's done a lot of research on on motivation in particular using some of these, for, for drawing on some of the things that the questioner is uh, describing. And what he did is, it was an experiment in a, a, a U.S. hospital. And the goal here was, how do we get doctors to wash their hands? Right. A lot of, lot of infections inside of, it's disgraceful, a lot of infections inside of hospitals, the most efficacious way to get rid of, to reduce infections is for doctors right. to wash their hands when they come in, wash their hands when they go yeah, out. That's an old story, actually. <laughs> right, but how do we get doctors to do this? Okay. And so what they, um, what he decided to do was he said, we're going to try three different kinds of appeal to mm -hmm. these doctors to try to get them to do it. Uh, one was, and, and, and they, they measured this by putting up signs next to the soap dispensers, encouraging doctors to wash their hands. So one sign said something like, um, um, uh, wash your hands, it'll keep you safe. Right. Okay? Second one said, essentially, wash your hands, it's, um, it'll keep your patients safe. Okay. okay. And the third one said, gel in, gel out. It was sort of a memorable kind of marketing right. slogan, okay? The idea, like, we'll make it stick, okay? And so the question is, you know, which is going to be more effective in getting these doctors to actually wash their right. hands? And so they actually measured it in a very clever way. They measured, they weighed the soap dispensers beforehand and then after the experiment to see how much soap was used. They had actually basically spies tallying who was washing their hands and who wasn't. And it turned out that two of those appeals did nothing to motivate the doctors. And one was extremely effective. And the one that was effective was not the gel in, gel out memorable slogan. And it was not wash your hands and avoid getting sick. It was wash your hands and you keep your patients healthy. It was that appeal wow. to a purpose, appeal to something more important that actually ended up changing their behavior. And I, and I think that if we bring those kinds of things to the surface a little bit more, we can actually uh, you know, use some of these motivational techniques to make the world a better place. That is not only to sort of liberate you to have a more meaningful work life, but actually to do things in our environment to make the environment in our world a little bit better. 
Okay, so you actually reminded me of uh, your extremely famous uh, TED talk. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you, after the studies you presented there, um, some of them were uh, made by uh, uh, Dan Ariely from Duke University, I was wondering if in the meantime you found some new research, some new stuff you'd like to uh, you know, uh, study upon and share. On, on motivation? Well, that study was actually, yeah. the, one, the one I just mentioned was one of them. That study, where okay. is it? It's around here somewhere. That was just published maybe three weeks ago. Wow. Uh, and so we see this over we see this over and over again that um, that you know there's a lot of there's a just a huge accumulation of evidence out there that it's possible that that motivation is more complex, uh, more complicated, but also in many cases more noble than we tend to give it credit for. That human beings are very interesting creatures. We we do things not only to survive. We do things not only to get rewards and punishments, but we do things for other higher deeper reasons and if we forget that then i think we shortchange ourselves we shortchange the people we're working with and we shortchange the world by keeping certain talents um hidden okay so what do you think are the biggest um barriers when it comes to implementing this kind of the results you know we, we already have into actual businesses I think it's a, I think it's a mix of things. Um, I think there are a lot of barriers in inside of organizations. One of them is that these these kinds of you know, again when I talk these certain kinds of motivators that can have a harmful effect on creative and conceptual work. What I call if then motivators. If you do this, then you get that. Um, those are those can be devastating to higher order work. Right. What. The problem is, is that those if-then motivators can be effective in the short term. That is, people will respond to them in the short run. So they often will have, um, if people care only about very, very short increments of time, then sometimes they can be effective. So if you're a sales manager and want to get your sales numbers up by the end of the month, give people a huge bonus for closing deals by the end of the month. Right. You'll hit your numbers. You'll hit your numbers. Uh, you, you might do all kinds of collateral damage in the long run, but you'll hit your numbers. Right. So they work in the short term. The other thing is, is that, um, you know, we're used to doing motivating people this, in this carrot and stick way. And I think the reason for that is that those carrot and stick motivators actually can be effective for the routine, algorithmic 19th and 20th century work. And so we're used to doing it this way. So that's a barrier. We're, say, we're basically saying, you know what, all these other ways we've been motivated, these ways we've been motivating people for all this time. We got to shift to something new. There's inertia, momentum behind the old way of doing things. And the other thing that I think that allows these if-then motivators to persist is that they're easy. Um, it's much easier for me to say, if you do something great, I'll give you five thousand dollars. That's that's easy. It's harder for me to say, what can I do to put you in a position where you have sufficient amounts of autonomy and self-direction that's right for you. What can I do to put you in a position where you're making progress and achieving mastery? What can I do to make sure that you see the connection between what you do every day and some outcome in the wider world, that you have a sense of purpose when you go in there? That's pretty hard. And so I think for all of those reasons, these, these old-fashioned motivators end up being pretty persistent. Okay, my last question um, is, what is the question that you never get asked, but you think would be really, really interesting to answer? Well, I'm not that interesting of a guy, so I don't know what oh, the what that <laughs> what that question would be that I never get asked. Um, I don't know. Do you have something? I don't. I don't really have a good answer for that one. Do you, do you have a question? I mean, well, sometimes sometimes people want to know how I got the last name Pink. Really. Yeah, but and that's not very interesting. Um, okay. I'm sorry, Maria. I don't have anything. Yeah. No worries. No worries. Um, Dan, thank you so much for being with us today. Pleasure. Thanks for having me.